Hey guys, how you doing? Morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Morning, Hal. Hey, Paul. How are you? Doing great. Good. I'll give people a minute to jump in the room here just so that you guys know we have a hard stop today uh, just a smidge before noon. Uh, at 12 noon, every once a month, uh, Bergen County Partners has its, uh, its monthly mandatory staff meeting, which is 12 to 1.30 today. So we're gonna, I'm going to keep an eye on the clock, and we're going to have to stop it a little bit earlier than we normally would. So just be aware of that. Yep. Um, and I guess what I would say is, um, there we go. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. Because this is uh, the, the module that we're going to do on um, farming and open houses. And because we're, sh we're shaving a half an hour off, uh, if we're going to move pretty quickly today. Uh, but in the event that we run out of time, <clears throat> we'll just pick it up um, and finish this up when we get together on Friday. All right. Sound like a plan? Yep. All right. So I'm going to get rolling right into it. So um, this is where we are back in the Parthenon, right? So we had kind of gone through these base and just to kind of reiterate that these foundational issues of figuring out your validity in the market, figuring out who your target audience is, thinking about how you're going to tell that brand story through your marketing and prospecting and working your database. Those are the platforms for everyone's business. Everyone should be thinking about those things as it relates to their business. Then we're up at the top here with different pillars, right? And these, just, these are just different lead generation levers that you can use. And uh, we're going to talk about a couple of them today. I want to start with farming. And um, I, I did an office hour at 10 o'clock this morning, and we had a good conversation going about, uh, about farming strategies, interestingly enough. And um, let me just throw it out to you guys. When you think about farming, what exactly is farming as it relates to real estate? What do you, what do you think farming is? It's a pretty basic question, but I'd love to get sure. your preparing your uh, preparing your lot and uh, growing your feet, so to speak. Yeah, so to speak, right? It's preparing, and and it's um it's very intentional, right? It's uh it's very deliberate. You think about farmers, um, they are a couple of things that they do is they they're very purposeful about what crops they grow, when and where and why, and um. It's not something that you can do kind of half baked, right? You can't start farming and then stop farming and then start farming again. It's, it's you just gotta, it's a constant thing. And uh, there's a couple different kinds of farms um, we're gonna talk about in a minute. It, it is about market segmentation. Who am I looking for? Where do they live? Uh, what do they like? You know, all that sort of stuff. It's really narrowing down the market. And I just wanna drive that point home yet again how important it is to have a geographic anchor to your business. We talked about this. This is what started the conversation at uh, 10 o'clock in the, in the office hour was uh, uh, an agent was talking about the fact that her business is kind of all over Bergen County. She is really diverse and um, wasn't sure if that was a good thing. And um, we talk how important it is to really get that message out consistently in a smaller niche market. Uh, there's geographic farming in terms of, um, you know, where people are, but there's also demographic farming. And a lot of times people will want to start to farm a key demographic and maybe they want to work with downsizers and maybe they want to try to farm first time home buyers or whatever that demographic is. My recommendation around this is layer that demographic inside of your geographic footprint because otherwise you're going to get too fragmented, right? Um, what we had talked about earlier with target marketing is figuring out who meets the criteria of who you're trying to get in front of and then making that target fit inside your geographic area, right? So some myths I just wanted to dispel about farming because a lot of folks kind of have some thoughts about farming that I just wanted to dispel. Myth number one is it takes too long and it costs too much. You know, farming takes time. I can't argue that. You know, farming is not a... Uh, a get rich quick strategy. It does take time. Um, but 
doesn't have to necessarily cost a whole lot. Farming techniques don't always have to have a, a lot of money involved in them, but farming is something that does take time. However, once you've got that farm established, it can really become the core of your business. Myth number two, someone already dominates my farm. That's not actually a, a myth. That's actually true. Someone else has already got market presence in the area that you want to be, and it may not be you yet. Um, the question is, how are you going to, how are you going to combat that? What are you going to do about that? You know, for starters, no one's ever as dominant as you think they are. And, and by way of, of thinking about those numbers, when I first started in real estate, you know, 18 years ago, 17 years ago, um, they used to use as a benchmark 20%, meaning if any one agent had 20% market penetration, um, that was probably going to be a 900 pound gorilla that would be really hard to contend with. And, and I would say that that's probably true, right? What you're going to find though, is that the dominant agent in your market is never usually more than somewhere between six and 8% market share. And, and while that's a crushingly good number, it's only 8%, you know? And so if you, we've talked about this perhaps before that if you were to rank order all the agents who do business in the area that you want to do it in, by the time you get to number 10 on that list, you're probably looking at somebody who's got less than 1% market share on their own. So the point is you need to know who are the players in your market. You need to be familiar with what in fact is their value proposition and how do you compete against it? But, um, there's ne ne never anybody as dominant as you think they are, right? Myth number three, a farm limits you to that area or specialty. And that is not necessarily true. The thing that a farm does is it focuses you. I would never um, turn away business, good business that made sense. If someone brings an opportunity to me from my database and that happens to be not someone who lives in the geographic area that I'm farming, if it makes sense, I'm not turning that business away. That's stupid, right? If it doesn't make sense, I'd refer it out, right? But the, the reason why we farm is because if we farm an area, um, it, it, we can control the inventory in a more select space. And that inventory is going to try to find buyers who are looking in that space that we've got knowledge of and all that stuff. It doesn't mean you don't do business elsewhere. It just means you don't try to generate leads elsewhere. Right. That's the real key on geographic anchoring. Myth number four, it's all about mailers and mass marketing. And it's not. Uh, there's lots of different things that you're going to do. We're going to talk about strategies in terms of marketing and prospecting and all kinds of activities. I do believe that there is a place for direct mail uh, in your overall farming approach. Um, however, I think it's really critical that you only direct mail to a very targeted list. And what I mean by that is if I'm looking for perhaps uh, a downsizer, right? If that's, the, if that's the demographic that I'm looking for, <clears throat> I'm looking for people who are downsizers who live in the communities that I'm working in. Well, I'm going to start to think about what are the criteria that would lend themselves to being a downsizer, right? It's probably going to be someone of a certain age. It's probably going to be someone whose children are out of the home. It's probably going to be somebody who's owned their home for, you know, probably a good number of years. It's probably going to be somebody who's got positive equity in their home. And all of these search factors are, are things that you can, you can get lists that narrow that down. What I would do is I would take that list of however many people that was, and I would direct mail that list. I wouldn't direct mail everybody in town. Not a big fan of everyday direct where everybody on the mail route gets a postcard from you. Even though it's cheaper to do it that way, the vast majority of people on the mail route are not the people you're trying to get in front of. But once you've got that targeted list, I think there is a place for direct mail. Um, one of the things that I would encourage you to think about in terms of what you mail them, uh, I would do just listed, just sold cards. And, um, it's funny because we've been using just listed, just sold cards in this industry for decades. When I was managing for another company, what we would even encourage an agent to do is once they've listed a home or sold a home, we encourage them to send out 250 postcards and we would match it with another 250. And we would actually send 500 postcards out. Well, the reason why that's not a smart strategy is because the conversion rate on one piece of mail is just too low right? Marketing is about repetition. It's about getting in front of them again and again and again and again. And we know that it takes lots and lots of touches to get that mind share that we've talked about. And uh, the Direct Mail Association, I believe the current numbers 
would be that for any single direct mail piece, even with a strong call to action, the conversion rate is about three tenths of 1%. And it's just too expensive to send a postcard once. What does make sense is if I've got a targeted list or I've got people in my database that I'm reaching out to on a regular basis, that a handful of times a year, maybe six times a year, they all get a just listed or just sold card, even though they may not live in the community where that transaction occurred. Why does that make sense? Because I'm not trying to announce to the neighbors. I'm just trying to reinforce in my database and in my targeted list that I'm successful at listing and closing property. And that message again and again and again is probably the best use in my estimation of direct mail, but I think there's a place for it. Myth number five, you can start and stop your farming. Not so much. Uh, my wife's family owns a dairy farm in um, Delaware. It's got a lot of cows. You can't decide not to milk the cows one day. They don't like that very much, right? And so uh, you got to do it consistently. What I would say is start small to something that you can manage. And as you've got more resources, build it out. You know, my wife's family started with a smaller plot of land. And as they became more successful, they bought more land and they grew a bigger farm, right? But you can't stop and start it. It's either you do it or you don't do it. My recommendation is that you do it. Um, but it's not something that you can just start and stop, right? So let's talk about selecting your farm. A couple of things to think about. One is your goal. Two is your budget. Three is the size of your farm. Where is it? All these different things we're going to touch on a little bit here. So, so let's, let's start with where. And I'd love for, for you guys, somebody to just unmute. Um, maybe I can unmute all of you if it's not too noisy in the background. I'd love to just have a conversation about where should your farm be? How do you start to think about that? Anybody? You're all unmuted now, so be careful what you say. What do you think? Where should your farm be? Near where you live. Why? Well, it's easier and you're more likely to know some of the people on it. Uh, you know, for starters, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, Marianne, because if it's far from where you live, it's really hard to service. I, I had started to farm an area, the office that I first joined when I got into real estate. Um, I'm actually going to mute you guys up again because there's some, some noise in the background. I'll ask you to unmute in a minute. Um, the office that I first joined was in Somerset County and the area that I started to work was further out into Southern um, Somerset and into Hunterdon County. And I live in Union County and it wasn't terrible. It took me about a half an hour, 45 minutes to get there, but it's really hard to service when you get that phone call from a buyer's agent who said, Hey, the last knucklehead who showed this house didn't put the key back in the key box. Do you have a spare? Yeah, I do. I'm 45 minutes away. That's hard, right? The other thing you want to think about is, is do you like being there? You know, because you're going to spend a lot of time there and do you like it? Do you resonate there? Is it, is it, is it a place that you connect with the people that live there? Um, I didn't farm um, in this area, but I did a lot of business. I had a relationship with a, um, with a, a, a big investor who had a lot of bank owned properties back in the day. And uh, they had a lot of them to sell. And I, I did a lot of REO work for them. And many of their properties were in sort of Western uh, Plainfield. Now, if you know Union County, if you know Plainfield, the Western end of Plainfield uh, can, can get a little dicey at times, can be a little tough. And um, I'm not opposed to working in any neighborhood. You get street smart, you know how to take care of yourself. You, you, you know when to go in and when to not be there and all that sort of stuff. At some point I just decided, you know, there's a business opportunity here, but this isn't my opportunity. I don't feel like this is a place that I connect with in a way that I can serve to the level that it deserves. Um, and so you, you, you think about all those things, right? Turnover rate's a really important factor because a lot of times what you've got to make sure of is that the area that you're farming, that there's enough turnover, that there's enough transactions, that you get enough chances, right? And certain neighborhoods turn over more often than others. Um, again, back in the day, the turnover rate that people said to look for is about 10%. If one out of every 10 homes in, a, in the community sells every year, there's, that's pretty good churn. You'll have a pretty good uh, number of chances there. I'm going to tell you that 10% turnover rate is not something you're going to see much right now. And we haven't seen a 10% turnover rate uh, in years. Um, 
Why do you think that is? Why do you think it happens that the, tur- the homes are not turning over quite as robustly as they had in recent years? Any thoughts around that? I think part of the reason is if the NAR says that the sweet spot in terms of of people moving is about every 10 years. Well, if you bought your house 10 years ago in 2010, what happened for the first couple of years? Well, for the first couple of years, you lost value and you kind of, you kind of lost money until maybe third quarter 2012. And then it started to turn around. And so when you really look at it, that 10 year cycle implies that people have earned enough equity that they can afford to sell the house, make enough profit to turn it over into the next house. And for a lot of folks right now, the equity position isn't there yet. Um, It's coming. Um, We're not 100% in New Jersey back to 2008 values across the state. We're there in you, where you guys are. We're there in Bergen County for the most part. But there are still some pockets in New Jersey where prices are lower today than they were before the economic meltdown of the 2008. And so if that was you, you lost your skin and you don't have any equity, right? So the turnover rate of 10% isn't really there. What I think is a better way to, to go after it is take a look at all the turnover that happens. And how would you figure that out? Where would you go to figure out how many, how many transactions there are in the course of a year? Anybody can unmute and tell me where you'd get that data. Anybody? Can you go to uh, MLS? MLS is, you can, but not every transaction. So, is gonna, mm-hmm. Right? What we know is that probably 10 to 12% of all the transactions are outside of the MLS. Some of them are for sale by owners. Um, some of them are, are, well, kind of they're all for sale by owners in some ways, but some of them are transactions that happen where the buyers and sellers already knew each other. There was no marketing involved. You know, dad sells it to the son, grandma sells it to the grandchild, that kind of deal. Um, you, where, your easiest place to do it, I think, and what I always did, was I just went to the tax office in the town because they know how many people are selling their homes each year because they've got a change in the tax bill. And you can just go to the tax department and figure out how many deed transfers were there. What you're looking for though, is probably not 10% right now. What I would look for is if I could get 2%, if I could get 2% of all the turnover that is out there, what does that look like? I, I, as a coach, I've often built plans for folks to get to 2% market penetration. And you go back to this idea of the dominant agent is rarely as dominant as you think they are. 2% in most towns is probably going to put you in the top five to 10 agents in that town. In most towns, there are some towns like Ridgewood, for example, where there are so many dominant players that nobody has overwhelming market share but a lot of people have sort of that two to 3% range, right? Um, But the thing that I would say is, what would it take to get 2%? And you look at how many transactions there are, if there's 100 transactions a year and you can get 2%, that's two deals. Is that enough? If it's not, you gotta do some math. In fact, the way that the math works is this. You go back to your business plan and your goal setting and you start to calculate how many transactions do I need to close? in order to hit my goals. And then you start to do a real assessment of the strength of your database. And what you look at is how many do I expect this year that I can pretty much count on just coming out of my sphere of influence, friends, family, people are gonna call me up and give me an opportunity that I can close. What percentage of my total do I expect to come out of my database, right? And the remainder have to come out of your geographic base. So, so here's how I would do it. I'm going to get my phone out too, so I can have my calculator. Give me a second because it was plugged in. Um, and so if I need 20 closings a year to hit my goals, if I think I'm going to, I can pretty much count on five coming out of my database, then I need 15 closings to come from my geographic market. If I can get 2% of everything in my geographic market and I need 15, 15 is 2% of what number? I take my phone, I take 15, I divide it by 2% and what I get is 750. I need 
in the town that I'm working in, the geographic area that I'm working in, there's got to be 750 closings a year or that isn't a big enough target. That isn't a big enough farm, right? Um, and so if I had 400 in my first, in my primary town and I need 750, then I got to find another town that has the remaining 350 or another combination of towns. The more towns you've got in play, the, ch the more challenging it is, not necessarily because of the inventory that you've got to learn as much as you've got three different taxes, tax bases to understand. You've got three different school districts to know about. You've got three of all of everything, right? But the 2% rule is one that really works for me, is if I can get 2% of everything that's out there, what does that look like? Is the average sale price in your target market the sale price that you used for your business plan? Because if I'm building my plan that says I need 20 closings at $500,000 a closing, is my market supporting $500,000 sales? If it is, great. If not, I got to rethink that, right? So all those things, market conditions, right? What are certain things that are uniquely going on in your market that can impact sales, right? Certainly um, uh, when you're thinking geographically, development, <clears throat> you know, can be a part of that. Um, is, is the town uh, master plan uh, one where there's going to be more development or is the master plan one where development is moving other places, right? Um, so a lot of these things, again, 10 things to consider here. Um, it's about finding that specialty niche. Again, we talked about the 2% rule. It's time on task over time. And uh, what do you do? How do you work this farm, right? Myth number one is I don't have the money. We said that lead generation doesn't always require you to spend money. There's lots of different ways you can get in front of folks that don't have to cost money. What you really want to make sure of though is that in your geographic farm that you are, you are really telling your value proposition in a way that you're building your relationships and your reputation. People need to not only see you consistently, but they have to see you as a good person, right? Not just a successful realtor. They have to see you. Influence is about, is about um, liking people and it's about trusting people. People will trust you're competent if they see you doing business, but they're going to learn to like you by the reputation that you have. How do you treat people? What are the organizations that you get involved in? Be sincere about who you are, right? How do you show up on social media? What causes do you support? All that sort of stuff. Establishing your reputation in your geographic footprint is a really important thing to do because it is very much nurturing a farm is very much about building this farm of relationships, right? We're relationship farmers, right? Um, and and we, we go back to this notion of nurturing, you know, this, this database. It's just, it's just nurturing this relationship, right? Prospecting based marketing enhanced. We've touched on that before. Have, have something of value to give in your farm, you know, you think about all the different things that you can offer to folks in your farm. What kind of value can you give folks? Who could unmute and just tell me any kind of item of value that would be a good thing to give away in your farm? $100 bills, that's a good one. What else? Uh, I have a, like, a mailing going to a certain geographic area and I'll send uh, each time something like uh, how to prepare your house for sale or, right. information. Um, you know, information and, uh, you know, what's going on in town. Who's like places that are opening up and the kind yeah. of thing, like restaurants, the farmers. Maybe the market, source of information that. that's important to them. Absolutely. Right. It's that so kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, I think your app is a great thing. Your search app where people can, um, can have that on their phones and kind of search. Uh, what's going on in the area, all that stuff. But we've got to be seen in our farms. We've got, it's not something that we can just do through um, uh, mailers or signage or things like that. People really do need to see you face to face. We've got to be doing open houses, which we'll talk about in a little bit inside of our farm. So people can see you and meet you. We've got, you've got to be out there doing things like um, getting involved in community days, you know, having a table at uh, the town fair, whatever it is, people need to see you out there, right? Really critical thing about farming. I'll give you some examples. Um, Nicole Minetti and Tara uh, Dennis, do you guys know those two agents out of um, Ridgewood? 
Um, I used to coach Tara years ago and Nicole and Tara were both pretty good solo agents, but when they decided to come together as a team, and I think, I think it's Ramsey that they focus on. I could be wrong about that, but, but when they came together and they decided to focus on Ramsey and they decided that they wanted to get out in the community, that's when their business exploded. Right. And they would do cool stuff like in fall, they would have uh, a contest where people would put scarecrows on their lawn and they would have judges to have who was the coolest scarecrow. That's the kind of stuff inside of a farm that builds relationship that they, that you, they get to see you as a real person. Right. And it only happens that way if you're out there face to face with folks. Right. Come from contribution. Lots of things you can do. Organize a neighborhood yard sale, start a neighborhood website build a neighborhood Facebook group or YouTube channel or even a blog. Um, I've talked in the past about creating local business coupon books where you can go around town and, and find all the local vendors and, and encourage them to participate by saying, you know what, as a realtor, I, I help people move into this town all the time. And I would love to introduce people who move into town to your small business. Um, would you be willing to give a discount for whatever? 10% off your first dry cleaning service, a free appetizer with a rest in, at the restaurant for people who, who are, I can bring to you to try you out for the first time. And you just create a coupon book like that, right? All those kinds of things are things that come from contribution, which are good things to do, right? Be where your customers are, walk your neighborhood, reputation, join clubs, organizations. Again, we're moving quickly here, but, um, it, it's a lot of different things. You know, we're talking about things like um, sponsoring a little league team, taking out an ad in the high school journal, you know, play journal. All that sort of stuff is, is farming stuff, right? All those things are really important. Um, be prepared. If you're out and about, be prepared. Know your scripts, know your conversation frameworks. Um, not every conversation should be a, a, an ask for business, right? I, I do believe that the most powerful sort of colder call, if you will, it, when you're out and about is, is when you do have buyers, right? When you've got buyers who are looking to purchase a home in the town that you're focusing on and they haven't found it. It's just simply what we call the specific person script, you know? Um, hey, have you thought about selling your home? The reason I'm asking so directly is I'm working with this family right now. It's the Jones family and it's Bob and Sherry and they've got a little boy named Tom and uh, they've been looking for a home uh, in the area. We haven't found anything in the current inventory that meets their needs and I promised them that I would do whatever it took, even if it meant talk to every neighbor myself to see if we could find someone that might have some interest in selling a home. That kind of a script is a really good script because it repositions you from a salesperson to an advocate. And um, it's the kind of a script that really impresses folks that you would work that hard to, to talk to, to, you would do whatever it took, even if it meant talk to everybody in town, right? That's a really powerful script to use, A, when you're out and about in the neighborhood, and B, you got to really have buyers. Don't be the person who fakes that. I had an agent one time, tell me who's no, who's no longer with our company. He's with another company now. But he said, oh yeah, here's what I do. He says, every Sunday, um, I get my wife and son, we put them in the car and I go drive around all the for sale by owners and I knock on the door and I pretend that my wife and son are buyers that are interested in their home. And I want to let people know that I can bring buyers and you should really hire me. I'm like, dude, that is so cheesy. Don't do that. Don't do that. You know, your reputation gets to be your reputation, right? Build trust. You've got to market your listings aggressively in your target area so people can see how hard you're working. You're going to really amp up your open houses, which we'll talk about in a minute. Host seminars and classes inside your geographic farm. You know, there's a, a Zoom call today, I think at one o'clock on Keller Williams Connect channel somewhere. Should be in the emails that you got from your market center. But at one o'clock, there's a Zoom call on how to run a really good first time home buyer seminar. And, and that's the kind of thing that I think really plays out well inside your target market. Join organizations, get to know the renters, get to know the landlords, get to know the small business owners. Um, the small business owners is key. Um, there was an article in Inc. Magazine years ago that I read that said, um, small businesses are the backbone of, of America, of the American economy, always have been and always will be. And um, 
the fastest pathway to grow success in a hyper-local business is to just get to build a relationship with the business owners, right? Um, so lots of different things to build trust and recognition. And I'd ask you to think about what are some of the things that you could offer to position yourself as that market expert. So the first half hour, and I know we're flying here because we have a hard stop in about 25 minutes. The first half hour was simply, it's really important, I believe, to, to make farming kind of part of the cornerstone of your, of your overall plan. If you think about this idea of a GPS, right? And we use the term GPS to be the focusing tool that we use to focus our business. And I've done lots of classes on GPS as I have another one coming up in about two weeks if you're not familiar with how that works. But the idea is we have one overarching goal, which is the G. And that goal is usually a financial goal. How much money am I trying to make this year? P, priorities. What are, am I gonna prioritize my actions? Some of my actions should be prioritized into leveraging a database and nurturing that database. Some of my actions should be prioritized into building a reputation inside of a geographic area. And for most agents, if they focus on just those two things, they're gonna be just fine, right? S actually stands for strategies. What specifically am I gonna do, right? To make things work. Um, but that's the first part of this is, is I do believe that geographic farming is the cornerstone and the bedrock of every successful agent's business or, or the agents who really succeed in, 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 a, in a sustainable way. It's all because they've built market presence inside of a geographic community, right? Any questions, thoughts around geographic farming? Again, we're moving fast. Any questions about this one before we change gears to open houses? I want you to just remember the 2% rule. Try to figure out what would 2% market penetration look like. A lot of times people say it's only 2%. That doesn't sound like much. 2% is more than you think. You know, when I was running the KW office in Montclair years ago, we were the number one office in all of Essex County in terms of sale volume and unit volume. And we probably had a 25% margin over the number two office. And even still, we only had 8% market penetration in the county, eight. And, and so we were the 900 pound gorilla, 92% of the business, we didn't get a sniff. The thing that we just have to remember, remember from geographic farming is that nobody is as dominant as you think they are. If you could get 2%, which is a perfectly achievable plan with focused prioritized actions, what does 2% turn out to be? Is that enough? If not, I've got to expand my base. I've got to expand my geographics, right? Okay. Al, question. Bring it on. Cool question. Um, so, all right, when you're going through and trying to find that group, what would you suggest be the percentage of equity that the person you should look for, for someone that might be interested in selling? In terms of how much positive equity? Yeah. I don't know that there's a percentage exactly. I think you just want to make sure that people aren't upside down. And, 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 and to some extent, that's all projected because you're not really 100% sure that there's not liens or other things against that house. But, you know, you, you just, most of the time in, in a lot of these um, companies that can help you refine these searches, they can kind of project based on what the purchase price was and what the rate of growth has been over time as to what the projected equity is. And I don't, I don't think there's a huge number that is the target. You want to make sure that there's enough there that after real estate transfer tax and all real estate related fees, including your commission, that there's enough left over for people to trade up if that's the market that you're looking for. If they're trading down, it's less, it's less important. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right, let's move into opens for a minute. Um, the open house pillar. I don't know that we're gonna get all the way through this and we may finish this up on Friday. Um, your goal in open houses is just to be out there in the marketplace, increasing your brand recognition, being seen and meeting people, right? Now, from a marketing standpoint, the purpose of your open house is to create urgency and to create exposure, right? Um, we know that that's the sweet spot recipe for how to get the best outcome for sellers. If I can get the more people into the auction room and have something that people really want and create the fear of loss, then when the bidding starts, we're gonna get a lot of bidding and that bidding is gonna drive this price up to its highest. 
And open houses to me is probably one of the best ways to, to create that exposure and urgency. And, and what I mean by that, by urgency, is people need to know that they're not the only ones who are interested in this home. One of the challenges that we've had in a virtual environment is that as we've moved more into platforms and we've done virtual tours through Matterport and lots of different things, we haven't always necessarily used a platform where people saw that there were other people in the room. We many times did things on a, on a webinar platform where they could see it and we could have 15 people watching the thing together, but the 15 people didn't necessarily see that there were 15 people there. You saw that as the host, but they didn't, right? And I think that's important, right? Because I think when you think about it, once I position a home in the market and I've created a home that shows well, it's priced well, it's a great value, and we do the first public open house, if there's nobody that comes, but you as a potential buyer, you're gonna think, hey, there's not a lot of competition here. There's not a lot of interest here. I can go in with a low offer. However, if you've got an open house that's got a line of people standing in the driveway waiting to get in, and you get 30, 40, 70 guests. I remember talking to, uh, who was it? It was one of the agents in Ridgewood. I'm trying to remember who it was, who had done an open house in Paramus before, we, before the, the lockdown, but managed to get like 170 guests through, 170 groups through, which lent to probably 15 to 20 offers. And, and believe me, they went way over ask, right? So a lot of times people say open houses don't work because they look at it from the wrong lens. I think what they think is statistically the odds are low that the person who buys the house is going to walk into the open house and buy it there. And that is statistically low, probably 1% chance, maybe even less. It happens to every real estate agent at some point in the career, they're going to sell a house at the open, but that isn't the reason we're doing it, right? We're doing it to meet people, we're doing it to create urgency and greater exposure in our market plan. And I think they're an important tool. And for me personally, it was the number one way that I grew my business. Ron Cathell, who's in Arlington, Virginia, a mega agent there, says opens are the easiest, simplest, fastest, cheapest way to grow your business. And I believe that's true. In the Ignite course 2.0, which just released in May or April, it is built around open houses because open houses are the fastest, easiest, simplest way for a newer agent to gain momentum, right? So how do they do work? Let's talk about some of the myths. Uh, they're only for new agents looking for buyers. Again, experienced agents do opens all the time. Um, they're not just for looking for buyers. They're looking to create that market exposure. They're also looking to, to build relationships, to meet people. Um, Chris Suarez, who runs the, uh, the Experian team out of Portland, Oregon, has a number of agents on his team that are, that are uh, outposted in some of our offices in Bergen, Bergen Partners. And, and one of the things that he talks about is um, traffic pattern open houses. And you say, well, what's a traffic pattern open house? Well, a traffic pattern open house is leveraged on the fact that certain neighborhoods see an uptick in traffic at certain times of the day. And if open houses are a strategy for how you're trying to meet people inside your geographic footprint, how you're trying to convert them from habit Mets to Mets, what he suggests that you do is not necessarily do an open house on Sunday. You're going to do the public open on Sunday for sure. You're going to, in a Sunday open house, you're going to attract the most likely buyers. The people who are purposeful about looking at open houses are going to go on Sunday because that's when most of them occur. But what he's saying is like my neighborhood, uh, before we were locked down, I'm, I'm looking right out the window here, um, probably a 10th of a mile to the school first to fifth grade. The high school is about a quarter of a mile over that way. And the middle school is about a mile further past. In my neighborhood, traffic patterns tick up during pickup and drop off times. And so if I was going to uh, want to meet the neighbors and convert people from haven't met to met in my geographic farm, I might throw an open house on a Wednesday afternoon between two o'clock and three o'clock. I don't expect that I'm going to find the buyer, the end use buyer probably there, but I am going to find the neighbors who are walking to pick up their kids who are curious, just poke in and take a look around and now I've met them, 
right? So uh, there's lots of different reasons why open houses make sense. And experienced agents use them all the time strategically to meet people in their target markets. Myth number two, I don't have any listings, so I can't hold the house open. We know that's not true. There's lots of things that we can do with other people's listings, right? Myth, this is actually a truth. A lot of agents sit open houses and to really have success, you've got to work an open house. An open house is a two week event. Week number one is preparation. And then there's the, the event of the open house. And week number two is follow up, right? Um, too many agents, I think, really do just sit the open house, meaning they just grab a bunch of directional signs on a Sunday morning, they throw them out and they sit in the house and they hope something good happens. Nothing, let me rephrase that. It's not that nothing good is gonna happen that way, but it's not gonna be as good as it should have been. If you really had worked, worked the open house properly, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, for agents in the growth phase, open houses produce buyers, they produce sellers, they produce re referrals. Um, one of the things you want to do is you want to set some goals for the open house. Um, how many people am I attending to meet? If, if I am using this as an opportunity to meet people, what's my goal? How many, how many leads, how many new people do I intend to put in my database? What am I trying to target, right? Set some goals for your open house. Do everything you can to get as many people there as you can. We'll talk about some strategies for that in a second. And then hold them consistently. Now, when I say hold them consistently, I don't mean the same house over and over again. I really am of the mind that an open house is designed to create a little impact of energy when it's needed in the marketing plan. And certainly when a house is new to the market, I wanna leverage that open house as a way of meeting people and creating urgency for a new listing. I'm gonna do everything I can to bring my house to market in a timeline that does not require me to cancel my public open. It's too important to my business to have that. And so if I put my house on the market on Monday, there's a really good chance right now with inventory being what it is and buyer demand being what it is, you put a listing on the market on Monday, there's a really good chance you're gonna have some offers by Friday. And by Friday, don't be surprised if one of those offers says, we'll give you what you want. In fact, we'll give you more than what you want if you cancel the open house because they don't want for you to create even more urgency, even more competition. Your fiduciary role to the seller is to get them the best deal that you can get them. And many times what a seller will say is, look, this is a good solid offer. A bird in the hand is worth something. And if I don't have to leave on Sunday and hold my house open to people coming in, that's fine with me. And then what you've done is you've accepted an offer, which is great, and yet the most important part of that marketing for your business, which was to meet people, didn't occur, right? So I'm a bigger fan of putting the house on the market midweek, later in the week, so that by the time offers begin to show up, it's the weekend. And then you can't begin a turn review. So there's really no reason to commit to anyone until Monday. Now you got the chance to get that open house in, right? That's, that's the, the timing strategy that, that I think makes the most sense. But, um, you know, you, you want to uh, do everything you can to drive traffic there. Hold consistent opens. What I meant by that was not the same house over and over again, but always be in your target market doing an open house. What happens is if you don't get a quick response and the house is on the market too long, holding it open starts to send a negative message. Um, I work for a broker um, as a manager. And my company had a, a, a structured open house program and we were required that a certain percentage of all of our listings had to be held open every, every Sunday. And there was a benchmark number and, our, and we were measured against how many open houses did we do. And to some extent, our bonusing was tied to that. So we were forcing people to do open houses. And, and here's what happens. If the house isn't selling and it's held open week after week after week after week after week, what does the market begin to think about that house? Anybody? Something's wrong with it. Something's wrong. This should have been gone by now. And look, they're advertising and, it, and I see all the signs, all the balloons and every single week it's, oh, it's back out there again. There must be a problem with this house. What does the market think about you as a marketer? This agent's not that good. And uh, it's just taking too long, right? So I'm not a fan of hosting the same house open week after week after week. I am a fan of opening it up 
when you need to generate some urgency in the plan in the very beginning, important, when there's a change, if you've had a price repositioning, if you've done something inside the house or with the property to increase its value, and there's something different that you want the market to see, then I would do that. But, uh, but week after week after week is actually more damaging to your brand reputation than it is positive. Different houses week after week after week, really strong for your brand, right? You might even team up with others and do a, a sort of a progressive open house, five or six together. We used to do that uh, where we would have a bunch of different agents. It's almost like one of those progressive dinners where you go to one couple's house for an appetizer and then the next one for the main course and the next one for dessert or whatever it is that we might, we might have five or six houses and, and encourage. Now there would have to be enough similarity in these homes in the same community, in the same price range, but we might even create like a little scavenger hunt and have a drawing, go to house number one and, and get your entry ticket there and go to house number two and whatever it is there. And then at the end, if you've been to all five houses, you, you qualify for a drawing or whatever it is, but you can do lots of different things like that to, to make the opens, <coughs> to make the opens interesting. Um, we talked about market urgency. Let's talk about how to prepare. Decide which house to hold open, right? Set your open house goals we talked about. Decide which one to hold open and make that decision early enough that you have a full week at least to, to prep, to get, to drive traffic to it. Um, again, strategically, I would pick one in my geographic farm. If I didn't have a listing of my own, I would find another agent who has had a listing in my geographic farm. If, if I take listings to, to hold open outside of my geographic farm, and you may need to do that in the beginning just to kind of get something going. But if it's outside of my geographic area, what happens is I'm gonna meet buyers who are looking for a home in a community that I don't know as much about. And then when I find those buyers, I don't know the inventory as well. I don't know the lifestyle as well. It's a harder conversion for me. And it's harder for me to position myself at the open as a market expert. You might be better off on a Sunday afternoon, instead of hosting an open house outside of your geographic area, you might do better door knocking inside your geographic area. They're both valid lead generation activities, but one is reinforcing your presence inside the community where you're trying to do it, right? You got to stage the house. Oh, well, let me back up for one more second about which house to hold open. If you're newer and you don't have a whole lot of inventory yourself, you do, re you know, rely on the charity of others, right? Sometimes when you reach out to another agent who's got inventory, um, sometimes you're asked to kind of do an open house and get them off the griddle because they've got a house that's overpriced and it doesn't show well and the seller wants it to be held open and they don't want to do it. Um, and so they'll be happy to let somebody else do it. You know, make your decisions around that. I, I think a couple thoughts around that is I'm not eager to sit a clunker, right? I'm not eager to sit an open house for a house that doesn't show well, that doesn't look good or whatever it is. And yet, if it helps me build a re relationship with another agent in my, in my office who is um, doing business in my target market, if I can do something to get them off the griddle with their seller, I might take that bullet and, and sit a clunker open house to build relationship with an agent who I want to be in rapport with. You know, it's a strategic decision, right? But um, I, I, would, I would consider doing that, right, for sure. Um, okay, stage the house. Make sure the house looks good. Make sure the house smells good. Um, nothing worse than going into a, an open house and having it feel like a frat party happened there the night before. Uh, so you really want to make sure the natural light is there. You want to make sure that the, the curb appeal is, is good. You want to make sure that the grass is cut, all that stuff, right? We talked about staging, I think, in another class recently that staging the way I look at staging is really more making sure that there's little scenes that are set up inside the house. So as people walk through that um, they could see themselves interacting with, with each other inside that house in a way that feels good. Right. I gave an example of perhaps a, uh, uh, a, 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 a jigsaw puzzle or monopoly board set up in a game room that was with all of it out there just to see you could almost envision playing Monopoly with your family and having a good time. Um, staging the house also, um, it, it also um, kind of creates that sense of um, I want this, right? 
So you really want to make sure that the house looks good. The house is staged well. Prepare to build relationships. Think about um, what it means to be the market expert. You really need to know all the inventory in town. You need to know what's being held open in that community that day. Um, one of the things that I would always do and I recommend that you do is by the time you get to Friday of, of the week that you're doing an open on Sunday, the, the other inventory that's going to be held open on the weekend is usually already advertised in the MLS as being held open. I want, I want to make sure that I've physically been inside and previewed every home that's going to be on tour the same day as mine is. Because there's a really good chance that people are going to come in and they're going to ask questions about that home that they just saw. And uh, if you don't know it well enough to answer their questions, um, you're not going to position yourself as an expert. Right? You don't, you're not trying to sell that home, but you need to know, you need to know it, right? So I, I, I make it a point on Friday to go out and preview all the homes that are going to be held open in the neighborhood that the people would likely also visit the day that they're out there seeing me. Um, be safe. Um, when you're hosting these open houses, make sure that you know where the entrances and the exits are. Make sure that you don't position yourself in a way where um, buyers are between you and any kind of an exit. There's a course that we teach called safety by choice, not by chance. And, and just being purposeful, not going down the basement stairs first with people behind you. Um, not parking your car, interestingly enough, in the home's driveway so that someone else could block you in. There have been instances where things have gone wrong at open houses and people have been uh, abducted or hurt, which is a red herring event. It doesn't happen often. I don't want anybody to be panicked about that. But many times what happened was the person was boxed in. They parked in the driveway. Somebody else parked in behind them. There was no way for them to get out, right? So be conscious of those kinds of things as well. Um, all right. We talked about setting goals. We're going to move on. Uh, we talked about which one to hold open. Is the house in a high traffic area? Does the house have any special features? Is it a desirable neighborhood? I want to talk about signage for a minute here. Um, there's a, I'm going to get to that slide in a minute, but I'm going to talk about it here because we're going to have to end in about five minutes. Signage is really important for open houses. And I know that some towns have uh, prohibitions against signs. And you got to do whatever the town allows or doesn't allow, right? But if you're allowed to use open house directional signs, um, this notion here of high traffic areas right here is really important because you want to make sure that your signs are in a high traffic area that can capture those people and direct them in to where you are. Um, a lot of times on a Sunday, I would be looking to see, is there in town a local church that might be having worship services as people let out, they can see my directional. Is there a breakfast place, a brunch place, a diner where people would go and as they come out, they would pick up my sign. Are there other houses that are being held open that I expect are gonna do well with traffic? I'm not gonna be a jerk and put my directional sign right on their lot. That would be bush league and ugly, but I do want one in the neighborhood. So as people are going to that house, they see that there's another house as well and they can follow the signs. The, the research really that, that we did when I worked at my previous broker, and, and I'll just put it out there, Jim Weikert actually is probably known for bringing public open houses the way that we do them into the real estate market in the Northeast. Uh, it was not something that we did uh, until probably the late 1960s, early 1970s. It was something that Jim saw being done in California and kind of brought that back East. And as it turns out, Weikert Realtors headquartered in Chatham, New Jersey, also happens to be in the same neighborhood as NRT Incorporated, which is the parent organization that owns Coldwell Banker, Century 21, ERA, Sotheby's, all those big brands is also headquartered uh, probably within five miles of that Chatham office. And so as Jim started to do these public open houses, the executives at NRT started to see the response they were getting. And that sort of got adopted by all the different brands, right? But what Jim found out was um, the number, the optimal number of signs that really works is between 10 and 15 directional signs, 10 and 15. And uh, a lot of people are like, hold up, that's a lot of signs. <laughs> it is a lot of signs. But if you really want to pull people in from 
the outer streets into the neighborhood where you are, if you want to pull people in from certain areas of higher traffic to where you are, you're going to need more signs that they can kind of follow the breadcrumb trail to where you are, right? Um, the other benefit of having those signs, so many of them is when people are coming into the neighborhood to tour open houses, typically people at that point who aren't members of that community yet, generally, what happens is they're starting to see your signs everywhere. They start to believe that you are the king of the universe because you, your sign is everywhere. Um, the, the manager of the Weikert office here in Westfield, who's now retired, he used to pay a guy to put 50 directional signs out every Sunday morning all over town. And it, they, would, they were pointed to all kinds of places. They weren't pointing to any open houses in particular. He just wanted, and, and Weikert is not the number one broker in Westfield. They're number three by a long shot. Um, and, but what Harvey knew is that when people came into town, if when they drove into town, there was a sea of yellow signs that they would believe that Weikert was the player they should be dealing with. And um, I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, right? 10 signs is, is what the research says you're aiming for. Uh, if the towns don't allow you to do that, you've got to live within those rules. Um, you could put um, balloons sometimes on those signs just to draw attention to them. A lot of towns have prohibitions against that as well. I would not put a balloon on a sign at a busy intersection. It creates a visual hazard. And that's why the towns don't really like them is because those balloons get right in your eyesight. And if you're on a corner where that sign is, people can't really see oncoming traffic very well. So that is dangerous, right? But as you get closer to the house and as you get at the house, what you really want to do is kind of create the sense of this is a party. This is fun. I've, I've seen some guys uh, who get these big um, inflatable things that you sometimes see at the car wash where the big guy has got the blower on the bottom and he's kind of like doing this everywhere, right? I've seen people put those on the front lawn, right? As a way of just coming in that says, this is high energy, this is fun, this is a party, you're going to love being here, right? All that sort of stuff is stuff that you want to do in terms of really preparing. So with that said, it is uh, 11.57. I'm going to call it a hard stop here. We're not done with this. We're going to pick this up on Friday. But I do have to be on the Zoom call with Al and uh, the others at noon. But give me a couple of takeaways from today or some thoughts, either about geographic farming or open houses as we've started this conversation. Al, your point about the timing um, is striking. Uh, you know, if you get that off that comes in, I don't know how often that happens with the stipulation. Don't you? don't have any more open houses or showings, you're limiting yeah. yourself. But if you have it midweek, you still you have know, that it's reservoir. Just it's just the strategy. You know, it's, uh, it's funny. I learned this, uh, that strategy, again, from Jay Schweppe, who was a, an old time broker up in Montclair. And um, his model was this. His model was put the house on the market on Thursday, do a broker's tour on Friday, do a public open on Sunday, and don't commit to review offers until Tuesday. And that was his plan. He also planned to price that home competitively low so that there was so much early excitement and bidding that they would start this bidding war and it would bid up high. But um, he was not gonna close it down without getting that open house in because he knew, A, it was his best way to meet folks and build his network, but he also knew that that was the best way for people to visibly see that they weren't the only ones who were interested. And if we're not reviewing offers until Tuesday, it's almost like the energy that gets built in a coming soon model where there's all this energy being held back and then it's released, right? So timing is everything, right? Timing is everything. Anything else? Nothing else? Oh, I see something in the chat box. Let me look real quick. Chat box says, thanks, gotta go. Okay. <laughs> That works for me too, because I got to go too. All right, guys, be well. Have a good day. We're going to pick this up and finish this conversation on um, Friday, and then we'll move into our next module. Sound good? Sound good. Hal. Great. Thanks, Hal. Go ahead. Um, any word on those, um, what I sent you yesterday, the recordings on? Yeah, uh, yeah. Here's what we found. Um, I got access to the BCP page. Uh, I had Chris Gareffa last night set up um, uh, playlists. So I could, I could upload the video, but I wanted them all bunched together in playlists. So all the Ignite videos were together, all the Legion videos were together. Uh, and I'm in the process right now of taking these videos. I've got 
75 videos, Please. sorting through them and seeing which one is which so that I can upload this, those into the playlists. So I'm working on that. They should be up within the next day or so. Great. Thank All you right. so much. I appreciate it. You got it. We'll Have see you guys. Day. See you later. Bye-bye.